The skeptics are not finished lobbing objections at Papias, however, for they also maintain that Papias' sources are questionable and too far removed to be trusted. For example, Carrier objects that, Papias also said he rejected what books said and instead relied only on hearsay because he considered that to be more reliable. He was thus clearly the least reliable sort of source we could possibly want. The statement to which Carrier is referring is from Ecclesiastical History 339-4, where Eusebius quotes from the introduction of Papias' writings. There, Papias is recorded as saying, For I did not think that information from the books would profit me as much as information from a living and surviving voice. So we can pretty clearly see that Carrier has mischaracterized what Papias actually said. Papias did not say that he rejected written sources. Indeed, we know from other fragments of Papias that he did use written sources since he periodically quotes them. All that Papias claims here is that he has a preference for living voices. Nor does Papias state that he exclusively depended upon hearsay as Carrier claims. Papias goes on to explain what he means by a living and surviving voice in the very same passage, saying, If then, anyone came who had been a follower of the elders, I questioned him in regard to the words of the elders, what Andrew, or what Peter said, or what was said by Philip, or by Thomas, or by James, or by John, or by Matthew, or by any other of the disciples of the Lord, and what things Aristion and the presbyter John the disciples of the Lord say. This is not mere hearsay which Papias describes. It is testimony from those who had heard the words of Jesus' immediate followers. But what about Papias' source with regard to the authorship of the Gospels? How trustworthy is this Elder John from whom he claims to have obtained this information? Bar Ehrman is more than a little pessimistic, claiming, Papias is not himself an eyewitness to Jesus' life and does not know eyewitnesses. Randall Helms agrees, saying, Note the third-hand nature of this information. A presbyter believed that Mark wrote down Peter's memories, a notion that Papias recorded and Eusebius copied in his writings. Is this really third-hand information, though? True, it comes to us through Eusebius, but we know that Eusebius, despite his biases, still copies his sources accurately. We can independently verify his citations in the case of Irenaeus, for example, and they are accurate. Moreover, as we shall see shortly, Eusebius creates difficulties for himself by preserving these words from Papias when he tries to distance Papias from John the Apostle. If Eusebius felt free to play fast and loose with his citations, he could have easily modified Papias' words here to make his job much less difficult, but he doesn't. As for Papias, his citations of scripture are accurate whenever we can check them, so both Papias and Eusebius seem to have a good track record. When they relay information, they do so accurately. Thus, even if the information is, strictly speaking, third-hand information, this need not worry us because we can independently verify that the latter two links are reliable transmitters of information. And what of this Elder John? Do we have any reason to suppose that he knew what he was talking about? Until the time of Eusebius, everyone believed that this Elder was, in fact, John the Apostle. This is clear, for example, in Irenaeus, who says of Papias that he was a hearer of John and a friend of Polycarp. Eusebius was well aware of this statement by Irenaeus. However, Eusebius disagreed with Irenaeus on this point, and his reason for doing so is pretty blatant. Papias believed in a literal millennium, whereas Eusebius did not. If Papias had been a hearer and disciple of John, this would lead considerable apostolic credibility to Papias' views on the millennium, and Eusebius was highly motivated to remove that sort of credibility from Papias. Monte Shanks explains, Twelve different fragments from ten different authors claimed that Papias had, to some degree, personally known the Apostle John. It is recognized that some of these authors depended upon others for their knowledge of Papias' connection to the Apostle. Nevertheless, some of the more credible witnesses of the Apostle John's mentoring of Papias are Irenaeus, Eusebius, Jerome, and Anastasius of Sinai. The only person that questioned Papias' association with the Apostle was Eusebius, who later in his life, unashamedly and unjustifiably, displayed gross prejudice towards Papias. Eusebius sets himself to debunking the idea that Papias had any connection to John the Apostle in Ecclesiastical History 339. 
He does this by attempting to draw a distinction between John the Apostle and John the Elder. His first argument comes from Papias' own words. Eusebius claims that Papias denies having ever heard the Apostles himself. He cites the following passage from Papias as proof. But I shall not hesitate also to put down for you, along with my interpretations, whatsoever things I have at any time learned carefully from the elders, and carefully remembered, guaranteeing their truth. For I did not, like the multitude, take pleasure in those that speak much, but in those that teach the truth. Not in those that relate strange commandments, but in those that deliver the commandments given by the Lord to faith, and springing from the truth itself. If, then, any one came who had been a follower of the elders, I questioned him in regard to the words of the elders, what Andrew or what Peter said, or what was said by Philip, or by Thomas, or by James, or by John, or by Matthew, or by any other of the disciples of the Lord, and what things Aristion and the presbyter John, the disciples of the Lord, say. For I did not think that what was to be gotten from the books would profit me as much as what came from the living and abiding voice. Unfortunately for Eusebius, nothing which Papias says here precludes him from having been a hearer of the apostles themselves. In this passage, he does indeed state that he had heard from those who had heard the apostles. But this is compatible with Papias also having heard the apostles. Stuart Petrie rightly concludes, Papias says neither that he was a hearer and eyewitness of the apostles, nor that he was not. He simply does not, in the passage quoted, mention the matter. Consequently, there is nothing to justify the careless confidence with which Eusebius contradicts Irenaeus. It is fair to assume that if Eusebius had been able to produce a more positive declaration from Papias, he certainly would have done so. More interestingly still, the quotation which Eusebius cites plausibly works against his intended point. In this quotation, Papias uses the word presbyter, or elder, to refer to Andrew, Peter, Philip, James, John, and Matthew. And in the same sentence, he identifies them all as disciples. Immediately afterwards, in the very next sentence, he uses the same word again, presbyter or elder, to refer to John, who he then also calls a disciple. So it seems clear that Papias uses the terms interchangeably. Far from proving Eusebius' point, this quotation from Papias supplies strong evidence that Papias does intend to call John an apostle when he calls him an elder. Bernard Orchard sums this up rather well. Eusebius finds it very significant that Papias lists John in the second instance outside the number of apostles, putting Aristion, who is not one of the twelve, before him, and clearly calling this John a presbyter. But there is no force in this argument, since he has already referred to the other apostles as presbyters. Furthermore, he has just called the other apostles the disciples of the Lord. This second John is therefore doubly identified as both presbyter and disciple of the Lord. That is to say, he is identified by two terms that equally apply to St. John the Apostle. Eusebius finds it very significant that John is mentioned twice, once with the other apostles, and then again next to Aristion. This, he thinks, implies that there must have been two Johns. But Papias uses the past tense when referring to the other disciples, indicating that they had passed away. He uses the present tense when referring to John and Aristion, indicating that John was still alive in his day. Papias almost certainly mentions John again in the second clause because he wants to emphasize that he was still alive. This makes perfect sense of Papias' statements, and it avoids the gratuitous assumption that there were two Johns. Eusebius' only other argument is that there are two tombs in Ephesus where someone named John is said to be buried, which, in his opinion, means that there must have been two people named John, John the Apostle and John the Elder. But this pretty clearly does nothing to indicate that Papias was intending to distinguish between an Apostle John and an Elder John. At best, it would establish that there was some confusion over where John the Apostle was buried. Orchard concludes that there were two tombs of John at Ephesus. All commentators agree that even if there was any archaeological evidence for two tombs, which there is not, their existence would be no proper argument for there being two Johns. In conclusion, there is good reason to suppose that the elder John mentioned by Papias is none other than John the Apostle, and no good reason to think otherwise. Eusebius' skepticism on this point is contrary to all of the earlier evidence, 
and was just clearly ideologically motivated by theological disagreements with Papias. Martin Moss sums the matter up very well, saying, The presbyter John is called a disciple because he was a disciple. His knowledge of Jesus was so intimate because he was the one whom Jesus loved. The writings were attributed to him because he wrote them. The second John is merely an entity multiplied beyond what is necessary. I conclude that the early churches near unanimous belief that there was one and not two eminent Johns in the period in question is vindicated. It is to the Apostle John, therefore, that we must attribute Papias' dictum about Matthew and the parallel one about Mark reported in Eusebius three sentences before it. On a related note, Skeptics have made much out of Eusebius' own comments about Papias' reliability. Ehrman objects, Later church fathers who talk about Papias and his book are not overly enthusiastic. The father of church history, the 4th century Eusebius of Caesarea, indicates that, in his opinion, Papias was a man of exceedingly small intelligence. Similarly, Carrier says, From the quotations we have, we can tell that Papias was a very gullible fellow, so much so that even Eusebius called him a man of very little intelligence. But as we have already seen, Eusebius' low estimation of Papias' intelligence had very little to do with the quality of Papias' writing and everything to do with theological disagreements between Papias and himself. As such, the fact that Eusebius regarded Papias as a man of low intelligence tells us more about the bias of Eusebius than it does the credibility of Papias. It is noteworthy that, despite his low estimation of Papias' intelligence, Eusebius nevertheless regarded him as credible enough to be a reliable source when it came to the origins of the Gospels, since, by his own admission, Papias was one of his primary sources for this information. Shanks correctly points out, Eusebius' statement that Papias influenced many others is a tacit admission concerning Papias' intelligence and literary capacity. Eusebius' admission argues that Papias was not so incompetent that he was incapable of significantly influencing future leaders of the church in the generations that followed. <laughs>